week. But today we're going to talk about some of what we talked about last week because we need to make sure and cover what we what God wants us to know. We need to realize for us that there are different requirements than there are for those people that do not follow Jesus. So part of God's uh, growing God's kingdom means that we have to be out in the community. Uh, let me ask you a question. One of our great community involvements is going to Food and Faith Barbecue, right? Okay, do you want to do it again? Yes. Okay, February the 4th at SUU at, uh, from 5 to 7 o'clock, then uh, we're going to have an opportunity to be there at uh, the Sharwan Smith Center in the ballroom. And uh, there's going to be some goodies and stuff, but it's going to be mainly an opportunity for students to come and meet all of the different uh, religious groups. So if you would like to go to that and just be there and you have to promise to smile, then you can see me and we'll be wearing our name badges. We'll have our own table. We'll be passing out stuff again. We'll have goodies and everything else. And uh, we'll get to meet a lot of these great students. So, um, so I hope Parasite will show up. And uh, not be over with that other group either. Uh, but anyway, so last time she was making snow cones and popcorn. And, uh, but this has become a, a really big event. So that's part of growing God's kingdom is where we just go and we just love and we just share life with students. Um, it's really a great thing. But I want to talk to you today again about soil types. And yeah, we did it last week, but... You know, one of the things is we're going to talk about God's Word, which is the seed, and we're going to talk about how important it is. And I notice that whenever I talk forcefully about God's Word and the power that it has, there were a lot of people missing because there were a lot of things that were going on. And so I thought that it would be good for you to understand how powerful this is, and then we'll figure out what type of soil that you are. But let me just read the uh, parable here. Uh, it says, then he told, Jesus told them many things. Let me get my arm extenders. And he said, a farmer went out to sow his seed. And we established a couple of weeks ago that the farmer, of course, is God the Father. And uh, he's out sowing seed. Well, what is the seed? The seed is his word. And so we'll look at the power of that seed and the vitality of it here in a little bit. He says, a farmer went out to sow his seed, and as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, or on hard soil. And the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it didn't have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil where it produced the crop and it was 160 or 30 times what was sown. Then Jesus says this, whoever has ears, let him hear. In other words, what he's saying is just don't do the audible, but do the heart transformation as well. So we need to understand that the seed, and the seed is uh, God's word. And so we never know that God's word never returns void. <clears throat> so what we need to understand that God said, um, God said in, in his word, he says, in the beginning God created everything. So he did create everything. The psalmist said in Psalm 119, he said, I hate double-minded men. What does that mean? That means that he, God does not like, or the psalmist did not like, those that said one thing and acted another way. We call them hypocrites. And hypocrite is just a term that comes from the Greek. And what it means is it means with wax. So they used to make pottery, and so they would spin it on a wheel. And so sometimes when they fired it, it would develop cracks in there. And so what they would do is they would fill the cracks with wax. Then they would sell the jug as being perfect. And so whenever you took it home and put it near the fire, of course, the wax would melt out of the crack, and lo and behold, it would leak. So... Uh, we need to understand that a life without God's Word is like that. We leak. We leak big time. Okay, so let me make some statements about God's Word. Word of God. Here we go. God's Word is the most important and most powerful force in the universe. 
And so we know that whenever God says something, it is going to happen. It may not happen in our lifetime, but it is going to happen. So we need to understand that God's word above anybody else's word. And so you don't need to be believing CNN or MSNBC or any of those other things or Fox News. What you need to do is get in touch with God's word and believe that. Amen. The next thing that we find is that God's word, all of God's blessings reside within his word. Because he's not going to do something outside of his word because God has integrity and unity within himself. It's kind of a tough concept, but if you go, okay, if I follow God, then I'm going to be blessed. If I don't, I'm not going to be blessed. You can look in Deuteronomy chapter 28 and you can find the contrast between blessing and cursing that happen. But all of God's blessings reside within his word. God blessed them, Adam and Eve, the first humans, and he said to them, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living cre creature that moves on the ground. So there was a time whenever mankind was sovereignly blessed by God, but then they made a choice. And so we can understand that whenever you depart from God's word, and it's not just your actions, but we'll look at the soil in a moment, and you'll find out that it's going to be your mind, your will, and your emotions, and that all fuels actions. So we knew that knowing that all of God's blessings reside within his word. The next thing that we look at is we look at God wants to bless you. Why would he create humans for his glory and his enjoyment if he didn't want to bless them? Oh, let's create some humans so we can punish them. We're going to throw shade on them humans. No. Is that the God that loves us and heals us? Is that the God that provides for us? Is that the God that sent his own son to die for us so that, and then raised him from the dead and then sent the Holy Spirit to be able to give us life? No. God wants to bless you. Satan wants to curse you. If you look at this scripture here in Genesis 3, you'll find that one of the things Satan does is he'll ask you, what did God tell you? And the best answer for that is whenever the enemy comes and asks you, you just need to say, go look it up yourself. <laughs> Don't debate with the devil. It's not a Flip Wilson TV sketch. It is actual warfare. And so whenever you understand that that's the case, see, he says, did God really say? I'll tell you a story. We were talking about this yesterday when we were working on the house, getting ready to lay down flooring and all that kind of stuff. And we painted all the walls now, and we have no more blue walls. Whenever we lived over in another house that we were renting, I used to walk every day. And so I walked by this one house that was blue on the outside. And I would ask God, God, would you please provide us a house? And I felt, I felt, that God was telling me, yes, it's the blue house. And so we kept walking by, walking by. And so our credit was really trash. And uh, so uh, we found a lender. And so we had this house that was a HUD repo. It was blue on the outside. And so we thought, wow, we'll put in an offer on this thing. And so we got a realtor lined up. We put in the offer. There had been no activity on this house for eight months. And then all of a sudden, buyers came out of the woodwork, went way up and beyond what we could afford, and so we lost the blue house. So we had to move out of the house we were in. We moved into a 640-square-foot apartment and a storage unit. And uh, uh, so then... God sold our house in San Diego, and so then we have we were free, and we could get a house. And so then we, I was looking in the paper just to see what was coming up. And uh, so the house that we're in now came up, and so we got a, we got a fantastic opportunity on, on the loan and everything else and bought the house. And then if you've been there before we started this remodeling, you know that the walls were blue, the carpet is blue, the sinks were blue, everything was blue, the countertops were blue, I mean everything was blue. And I said to Emma one time, I said, well I thought God said we were going to be moving into the blue house. 
Emma says, look around, dude. And so, you know, it's just, you think that something's going to happen the way that you want, but God has surprises. But the point is, is that the enemy, the enemy will convince you that what God said will never come to pass because it'll be good for you. The enemy will say, you can't believe God. Just think about all of the times when God failed you. Has God ever really failed you? No. You've probably failed God. We all have. Right. And so what we need to understand is that the enemy is after us. It says, uh, uh, the enemy also says, he told Eve, he says, you're not going to die. You're not going to surely die. You can go touch the tree. You can go flirt with the alternative. You're not going to die. And so we know that through that transgression of God's laws, we now have cancer, we got everything else, it's all coming in. So we need to understand next that the Word of God is a revelation of Himself. It is not just writings. So whenever you open God's Word, from beginning to end, no matter where you wind up, you're going to wind up with words that look like this, but it's life itself. Whenever you read the words, yes. sometimes you will go, oh, yeah, I got it. Here's the book of Job. Job says to one of his accusers, and I just flipped here, it says, how have you guys that are after me, how have you helped the powerless? It's a good question, isn't it? How have you saved the arm that is feeble? What advice have you offered to somebody without wisdom? <laughs> I mean, can't you just hear this going on in today's society? What great insight have you displayed? Who helped you utter these words? And whose spirit spoke from your mouth? It's Job 26. So, <clears throat> we need to understand that God himself is revealed from beginning to end in this book here. Amen. There's two chapters in the front that don't have any mention of Satan. There's two chapters in the back that have no mention of Satan. The rest of it all is about countering his devices and bringing about the blessing that God wants us to have. Read the book of Ruth. Here's a lady that technically is a descendant of Lot by an incestuous relationship between Lot and one of his daughters. And she now is a Moabite. Moab was the young man that was born to that incestuous relationship. And now she is going to be counted in as King David's great-grandmother. So, I mean, you don't know what God is going to do up ahead of you. So let's take a look. So the Word of God is a revelation of Himself. If you really want to see God, really want to know what He's like, you need to read the Old Testament stories. I mean, they are fantastic. We sang about it in one of the songs. Is uh, Goliath came out with a sword. David got him with a rock. The rock. It's our rock. So let's take a look back at the parable here. And then we'll talk about, uh, we'll talk about uh, our heart. Because I promised you that we would do soil prep. But so here we are back at the, back at the farmer. And we can see that the farmer scattered his seed. And so if we look at our own heart, we can see that oftentimes uh, we have hard places within our hearts, and we have rocky places, and we have thorny places, and so we also have good places. So we have all of those in different contextual mixtures within our hearts and minds. It's very important for us to do it. So we need to understand... Put up that picture of soil prep, would you? I really like this. Nope, next one. There you go. So here's what we need to do. Human hearts, human hearts are what we're talking about with soil types. And so whenever we talk about changing a human heart, we know that it takes a mighty act. Amen. Because the mind, which we have, stores up information based on education and based on experience. We have a will. Yes, I will. No, I won't. <clears throat> Just like we've often talked about with children, whenever the first words that they say is no. Not, not, yes, I'll go do that right away. They don't say that. Not in my experience. Maybe your kids did. They're perfect. So, 
So what we need to understand is that the change of our hearts, which is what the scripture is all about, we need to change it fully and completely. So it's just like this track, <clears throat> just like this tractor ripping up the ground, and you can see that it looks good on the surface, but as he's ripping it up, you can see the rocks, right? You can see probably if you look at some of that green stuff out there, you'd probably find that it was all thorny, right? That stuff. It's not rose bushes, okay? And he's ripping it up. Look at the size of that thing. So we know that whenever the Holy Spirit comes, and the Holy Spirit is going to start working on our heart, then it's just as intent and intense as this is. Because our hearts get hardened by life circumstances, our hearts get hardened by our own thought processes, and our hearts get hardened by our emotions. So whenever we understand that the heart or the soul that the Bible is talking about is talking about our mind, mental, our will, our strong desires, and our emotions. Well, we allow our emotions to rule us to the point to where we will negate God's word. Oftentimes it happens. Oftentimes the mind does too. One of my pastimes, if you will, is reading theology books. And so I read theology books. And I find out that some guys, uh, they're about 80% what I believe, and then the other 20%, they don't believe what I believe. So I have to be able to sift through that. Well, how do I sift through that in my mind? Well, what I do is whenever a thought comes across my mind first, whether I read it on the page, whether I hear it, or whether somebody tells it to me some way, what I do is I first go, does that line up with God's word? That's the first thing. We call that the threshold analysis. So if it lines up with God's word, then I'll go ahead and I'll bring it in and I'll start thinking about it. And how do I know that it lines up with God's word? Well, first of all, I realize that God's word, the Bible absolutes, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery, and all those things. Those things are biblical absolutes. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And a second commandment, like unto it, is this. Love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. So if you find yourself going out somewhere and not loving your neighbor, then you need to change your mind and your outlook. You need to be the most loving people that there are. And that means that you don't judge somebody. Okay, in today's world, we have people with all kinds of tattoos, piercings, and everything else. We don't judge them. We don't judge them. We just go, oh, hey, where'd you get the skin art? You know, who, who did that for you? You know, it's just you ask the questions. You don't go, oh, man, you're just like a pagan uh, Pacific Islander. You know? We don't do that. You know, what we do is we recognize that the heart is more valuable than just some outward component of their lifestyle. And so what we do is we go, man, I'm, I'm going to go out today and I'm going to love people. And whenever we do that, it opens us up to a lot of experiences that we would have and not have otherwise. So the first thing that I do is I, I ask myself, does this thing match up with God's Word? If it's somebody's theory and they say, well, according to tradition, but I don't like tradition as a model for godly conduct in the total, in, in the finer details. What I like are God's principles brought to life by the Holy Spirit in my life, my way. So I go ahead and I look at the thing that's come across my mind through my eye gate, ear gate, whatever. And so I look at it and I go, is this, is this a biblical absolute or is this something that his group believes, or is something that he personally believes? And so, if so, I'm going to judge it based on that. I'm going to say, well, it, that's, just part of the, that's just part of the academic system that he's in, so I'm not going to have to fall under that. I'm not going to have to obey that. I can think about it, but I can probably reject it. The one about, is it part of God's word? then that's the one that I'm going to have to look at. I'm going to have to go, yes, that is God's word. Whoa, 
I need to check out my life. So then I can take and look at those things, and I can see what I need to do, and I need to enter into my mind. Now my will is a little bit tougher, because my first thing is, is I start thinking in my mind, oh, that's a horrible project. That is really incredibly tough. Oh, that's a lot of work. You know, and then we say, well, I'm not going to do it. But what we need to say instead is, okay, God, if that's what you want me to do, then that's what I'm going to do. And you know where it starts? It doesn't start to where you have to go become a missionary to Bunga Bunga. What happens is, it happens in the very little things. You're standing in the supermarket, you're in the checkout line. You can tell that the cashier is a little bit frazzled. And so what you do is whenever you go up there like in the hens, they say, do you have a phone number with us? And you don't go, none of your business! <laughs> Are you invading my privacy? Are you a spy? <laughs> what you do is you just say, yeah. 435-590-5500, or whatever it happens to be. You just give them the number. It's innocuous. You're just giving them access to the amount of points that you have accumulated there in their, in their system. The other thing that you do is you watch them. And as they're going through the stuff, are they, be, are they smiling or are they not smiling? Do they look like they might be friendly or are they having a tough time? So sometimes you go, are you, are you doing okay? And that's a, that's a perfect question to ask. Are you doing okay? Oh, I've had a tough day. Oh, how long have you been here? Well, I've been here since 6 o'clock this morning. Oh, that is tough. I understand how that is. Probably have to deal with some difficult people. Yeah, there's been a few. Well, I know what that's like. So, I mean, already what you've done is you have taken the burden from that person. Or it's like even whenever you go out to eat and you go somewhere and you sit down and the server comes up and they're all happy and everything, and then you respond with happiness. You don't go, whatever happened to my favorite stuff that was on this menu? You guys are always changing the menu. So you need to change your will. In other words, I will react with kindness and love. I will not react with anger. Your problems are not their business. Their business is just to ring up your groceries or bring you your food. That's it. <coughs> so it's an, a way of understanding what I'm going to do, a way of understanding how I'm going to operate within God's economy and be able to bring peace and love to those around me, my emotions. Sometimes my emotions, we start off by saying like something like, I feel like, and then we go and make a decision based upon our feelings. Well, feelings are the very last thing that you need to use to, to make a decision. You need to, first of all, deal with facts. The second, you need to deal with, with things through faith. And then finally, deal with things through feelings. Because feelings come and go. I mean, some days we wake up in good shape. Other days, we've got to have a half a pot of coffee before we're even civil. I mean, you know, our feelings are very, are very variable. And so you don't want to make decisions based on that. You want to go facts first, faith second, and then finally feelings. And you don't make decisions. It's like it's a classical statement that pastors should not make a decision that involves money or a position on Monday morning. Why? Well, because I've worked up to this point, so has Pastor Allen. We've worked up to this point. We got a lot invested in, in this message. We've been trying to hear from God and have heard from God. We've had to put it together in a way so that knowing you, that it would be a receptive message for you. And so then by the time that Sunday morning gets over with, then we're going like, down like this, adrenaline-wise. And so then comes Monday morning, and yeah, we had one night's sleep, and so we're still negative. Oh, I don't know if I'm making a difference in this city. I don't know if people are ever going to come to Jesus Christ. I don't know if we can ever help anybody. Oh, yeah, I think I'll go out and try some healing somewhere. Uh, but that probably won't work. 
so what's going to go wrong today? So you just don't make major decisions. You recognize how the limits of your body are, and then you go from there. And so it's very important. Okay, so now, how do I change my mind, my will, and my emotions? The first thing that I will tell you is, you need to get positive Christian friends. Not negative friends. Amen. I don't think that you can really be, and here I'm going to go out on a theological limb. This is my personal belief. I don't think, think that you can really be a vibrant, active Christian if you're always dealing in negativity. Negative people are always destructive. Negative people always do harm. If you don't, if you doubt me, watch the news. What do you hear all of the time? You hear rumor, innuendo, the next bombshell, and what is it doing? It tears the fabric of a country apart. So it's negative. We hear it in our own lives. And if I am ever around and I hear an adult tell a child, you're never going to amount to anything, that adult may be on the way to meeting Jesus personally at that point. <laughs> we have a responsibility to speak the words of life, not the words of death. Amen. Do you know what you have done to that kid? See, it's just like the things where we, where we come up now with ladies that have been raped, and then they were not believed. And then now we've got all kinds of stuff going on. And who told them that they couldn't be believed? Who told them that? Who told them that they could never get beyond that? It was people that are looking at everything from a negative judgmental sense. And so we need to understand that, yes, sin and evil are rampant in our world. And they have an effect on us. But we need to be able to bring the words of life. Yes, it should not have happened. Yes, it wouldn't have happened if I was there. And no, 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 you are not damaged goods. So it's just horrifying to me to see all of this in modern media. And you just watch as people form opinions and start movements about something or other based upon experiences that they've had. Recognize it for what it is. Horrible traumatic, personally debilitating, and also it is not the act of godly people. I don't care how many crucifixes they got around their neck, it is not godly people doing that stuff. Okay, so I need to understand that the world has evil in it and that Satan will utilize and influence people to be able to do things to keep you from following God. And that's the basic, Satan hates you, Satan hates God. Satan's going to do anything that he can to, deb to debilitate you and defame you. So the next thing that I need to do is I need to be involved in God's Word. So as I'm in God's Word, I find there that Jesus himself went up to Mary Magdalene and he cast out seven devils. And Mary Magdalene was one of the ones at the tomb whenever he rose from the dead and he appeared to her first. He didn't go to her and say, hey, get me the high priest. I don't talk to women. What he did was he said, Mary. And she said, teacher. And so she went and told the rest of the disciples. So whenever we look at things, we need to understand that the Jesus way is the way that we need to go. What about other things that we need to do? How about we need to get and allow the Holy Spirit to operate through us? <clears throat> the Holy Spirit is not just power. The Holy Spirit is a person. Amen. And the person of the Holy Spirit dwells within us if we know Jesus Christ right. and enables us to follow Him. The Holy Spirit is the one that actually starts the heart change in us. David, the king, the great king, took and lusted after Bathsheba, committed adultery with her, and then her husband came back, Uriah the Hittite. He came back. He was one of David's mighty men. And so what did he do? 
He wanted Bathsheba. He wanted Uriah out of here. So he sent a message to Joab and said, put Uriah right up at the front line. Talk about a mob hit. That's probably where the Godfather got the idea. So he actually murdered somebody to get the guy's woman. But what did God do? God had him confronted by Nathan the prophet, and he said, you desire truth in the inward parts. What's David talking about? By the Holy Spirit, he's talking there in Psalm 51. He's talking about he, God wants us to operate truthfully in our mind, in our will, and in our emotions. God wants us to take his word and apply it in our daily lives. You can take the principles and apply them in their daily lives. Well, I don't know how to apply the Ten Commandments. Well, then go read the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5. Read Matthew 6. What does all that mean? How do I plow up fallow ground? I'm going to ask God here in a moment. We're going to stand and pray. Watch we stand now and we're going to pray. And I'm going to ask God to reveal to each one of you where the hard places are. Well, I'm not believing that. I've heard, I've heard all kinds of stuff. I'm not believing that. I'm not falling for that junk. I'm going to ask God to reveal where the rocks are. I'm going to ask God to reveal where the good soil is. I'm going to ask God to reveal where the thorns are. You can read Matthew 13. You can read the interpretation of it. You can see it applied to your lives. But it's all about the condition of your heart. It's all about that. That is the biggest thing. It's not about doing all the right things or doing things right. It's having a right relationship with God himself. Yeah. How do I improve my relationship? Yeah, yeah, Pastor always says, read the Bible, read the Bible. <laughs> Does Pastor get points for you reading the Bible? No. <clears throat> but Pastor gets to watch you grow into God's purposes for your life as you do read the Bible. I mean, I love yeah. the stories, not just because I got uh, reverend in front of my name, but I love the stories. Yeah. I mean, they are incredible. I read about Jesus. That's why we're going to watch The Chosen starting a week from Wednesday night. We're going to watch The Chosen starting at 7 o'clock. Come to pray at 6, hang around for a bit, then we'll watch the movie. It's a great way to watch this crowdfunded uh, program and be able to see it from a real-life type perspective. Jesus doesn't have a sense of humor. Oh, yes, he does. Go look at yourself. <laughs> Says God sits in the heavens and laughs. At who? That's what joy is. Amen. It's the ability to focus on Jesus and on others, and then finally focus on you. J-O-Y. Amen. Okay. Here's what I want to have. I want the Holy Spirit, because he's the one that does the ripping. I want the Holy Spirit, not me. I want the Holy Spirit to rip your hearts. I want him to remove the rocks. Yeah. I want him to uh, uh, till up the fallow ground. Yes. I want him to replace false things with truth. Yes. And I want things, I want him to instill a desire in you to establish and grow God's kingdom. Amen. That's what I want. That would, be, that would be the heart's desire. Because what happens is, is sometimes people come up and they say, Oh, pastor, you know what I learned? No, what? Oh, wow, that is fantastic. I want you to grow into God's purposes in such a way that you become an outpost of the kingdom of God in the lives of those that don't know. So let's pray.